Hello, and welcome to the Power Score LSAT podcast. This is episode 18, and I'm Dave Kaloran coming at you from Napa Valley, California. And I'm John Denning down in Los Angeles, California. John, how are things in Los Angeles today? You know, they're not bad. Gearing up for an uneventful holiday tomorrow, or depending on when people listen to this, maybe today. You can set off some fireworks, I hope. Uh, if fireworks mean book revisions and new course <laughs> updates, then yeah, yeah, it's going to be explosive. You're going to do some work then, just like me. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm going to be tied to the, the desk tomorrow, or again today. My fourth is not going to be much fun. Maybe when the sun goes down, I'll sneak out. Last year, I set off some fireworks for my daughter, and the, somebody, one of my neighbors, called the police. That sounds about so, right. That was great. <laughs> so I'll probably tone it down slightly. Yeah. Fireworks uh, around here, people are just glad they're not gunshots. So true. I could probably get away with it. That is exactly the case. So what are you drinking today? I've decided to drink patriotically. So I actually looked it up and discovered, a little fun fact right at the outset here, that the national spirit of America, we actually do have such a thing, in 1964 was determined to be, God love us, bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> So happily, I'm a bourbon fan, so that worked out. It, you uh, are. Yeah, if it would have been Cosmopolitans or something, I'd have been in a, in a tight spot. So I went upstairs and raided the liquor cabinet, and happily I found a bottle of Jefferson's Reserve, which if you've never had it, it's a great Kentucky bourbon, uh, named, as I understand it, for, well, one of the guys responsible for tomorrow, for our happy fourth. So, Tommy, <laughs> Tommy. I appreciate it. <laughs> I've never even Tommy heard J. of Jefferson's Reserve Bourbon. Well, you're I not a big say. bourbon drinker. I am not. But that's me. What do you got? Do you get all patriotic too? Uh, kind of, and then also not really. I am Explain. drinking a Pimm's Cup, which is obviously <laughs> a British uh, liqueur. Yeah, I see where you're going with this, and I like it. Yeah, so obvious, you know. When we go back in, and you can think, why is Dave drinking something that is from Britain? Two reasons, really, because obviously we came from there, and uh, this country was born by breaking away from them. And then, of course, also a, a little nod to the fact that the United States women's national soccer team just beat England. And, uh, You're really going to twist that knife, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Pour a little Pimm's cup in the wound. Yikes. I'm not sure they should have won that game, but they did indeed. And I love the little tea drinking celebration. So <laughs> that's where that actually go. comes I from. I respect your choice. Um, yeah, pity to our Brits. But I know you love the Brits and England and all that, but... I'm a fan. Today's a day for us. Sorry, guys. Yes, it is. What are we listening to then? Well, this is really an episode two, like a two-part deal, talking about this June test. So I felt like keeping in the theme of what we had done as an immediate uh, test review, where we talked about the Ghetto Boys, we would keep it in the same genre, do some rap. And I have picked for us today a song by Jay-Z, early song by Jay-Z, I believe, called Change the Game. Uh, and obviously that's a nod both to the genre and to the fact that we're making a big transition as the next test rolls down the pike here. Yes, the last paper test ever. 71 years of That's paper right. format. Now it is no longer 100% paper. Yeah. So it is a game changer. I'd pour some out if this bourbon wasn't so good. <laughs> right on your carpet. Huh? Right on the carpet. Yeah. <laughs> nice move. Right in another cup to drink. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I thought that song was kind of fitting. It is an interesting time that we're in. The last paper test, it's 100% paper, I suppose we should clarify. If anybody in July just got freaked out. No, no, I made that clear. Yeah, okay. I was on top of that point. I was drinking. So, it's a weird transition, though. I mean, this 50 50 period. It's going to be a strange couple of weeks, couple of months, really. I don't like it, but. Well, that is the LSAT world. Yeah, it's not my, my choice. My <laughs> this is being forced down our throats. <laughs> You know, and it's really more, we talk about what happened this week in the LSAT world, and obviously we've taken some time off um, in the last couple of weeks because of not just the June test, but the fact that this July test has required a tremendous amount of our time. So they've done a few things in the interim, but they've slowed down as well. They put out a few blogs on their famous law colon fully blog format. And maybe the most notable thing that's happened is Malcolm Gladwell did a couple of podcasts on the LSAT. Yeah, I, I think you probably have listened to more of this than I have. Um, and that's a yeah. safe bet because I've listened to none of it. So, dude, I have a tough time with Gladwell. 
He's hard to listen to. I like to. him in print, but... Mm. He's really easy to read. I think his thinking and his viewpoints are very insightful and interesting. Yeah. But, but when I listen to him speak, it's a challenge to kind of like enjoy myself. It feels like he's working so hard to kind of sound a certain way that I then as a listener feel like I'm working hard and I don't like that. Yeah. yeah he just it always feels, it makes me uncomfortable vicariously or something. I don't know. That and I always feel like there's going to be a pop quiz at the end. And it just like, dude. <laughs> well, he was the one taking to us this time. Yeah, but and... man, I mean, for a publicity stunt, which I don't even know how I feel about it. It's interesting to get other outsider views on the test. But, I mean, come on, this dog and pony show of like, I took the LSAT, now I have all these insights. Yeah. I'll say this about it. Having listened to most of it at this point, I think that episode one that he did, which is called Puzzle Rush, right. and it's available on the revisionisthistory.com website and, and podcasting and so forth, that's the more interesting of the two episodes to me. The second one, they, he does talk to LSAC, which I found interesting, and, and Lily Nizovich, who puts out a lot of the statistical information that yeah. we get. So they have a conversation there that I think is worth listening to. But in his first one, he talks a lot about taking the test and how hard it is. And he goes into some detail about how it's kind of upsetting to him over the speed factor that is required and, and what's the point of that. And it's it, and he really kind of mocks it and says that it's really useless. Why are, why are lawyers being tested on speed? Presumably and, then he favors the tortoise. Yeah, the second episode is called The Tortoise and the Hare, and he's like, right. why are we giving the hare the advantage here? And he talks about what happens when they take speed out, and he uses a, a really cool chess example. And I think if if someone's out there struggling with the test, that first episode is really good to listen to because you start to realize, hey, maybe it's the format that isn't perfect for me. Right. And that if they took this time away, I might be fantastic at this. But because of the constraints that timing gives you, this is kind of a challenge. And I think it's actually really reassuring for a lot of people yeah, to understand. They're not, it's just, they're not bad at logic necessarily. They're just not great at it under speed. Yeah. I know so, you hear this all the time too from uh, students who are struggling. I've had people in class approach me on the verge of tears and say things like, am I even going to be able to be a lawyer? I'm struggling with this test so much. Or can I even get through law school? I obviously don't have the skills to do it. I'm like, yeah, but you, you might have those skills and they're just masked behind this unreasonable speed that's demanded of you. It's it's yeah. not exactly the closest analog to what you do as a lawyer, certainly what you do in law school. Well, how many times are you in front of a judge who says, make your argument in 60 seconds? Right. That's not what happens. Right. Or you have one hour to write this brief that will then be reviewed by the court. Sure. They do that in law school a with little bit. time tests, yeah, but they don't bit. do it in the legal field. But a lot of what you do in law school is like, by the end of the semester, you must complete. It's like, all right. I do think he missed a big point because his, his general theme was, why does speed matter? And interestingly enough, if you think about that on the surface, you're like, yeah, why does it matter? Until you realize that some of these lawyers are out there making five hundred, seven hundred and fifty, a thousand dollars or more per hour, mm. and all else being equal, when I hire a lawyer, <laughs> speed does matter because I don't want to pay big bills. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, it makes a lot more sense why this might actually relate to the practice of laws because you don't want a lawyer who takes ten hours to solve a problem that a different person could solve in an hour. Right. So. To me, that's he didn't address that question. He, he he put forth a really interesting discussion, and I appreciated where he was coming from with it, especially how it affects you know the average person who is taking this who might be struggling. It gives them a different dimensionality to the problem. Mm -hmm. But I, it's very one sided, and he didn't like the logic games. I can tell you that much. <laughs> a shame because I know it's our favorite section. Of course, he made a huge mistake in my opinion. Is that he went and he talked to uh, the people at Noodle. And if okay. you follow LSAT preparation, I don't mean this in any offensive way because I know some of the people over there and I think they're good people, but they don't know anything about the LSAT specifically. They're not specialists. They're certainly not focused in the way that John and I are on this test or, or some of the other people in this industry who I respect. And so he ended up talking to John Katzman, who was the guy who founded the Princeton Review. And um, 
Princeton Review was founded back in the 80s. They obviously did a lot of great things. They have faded into obscurity and they've been sold several times. And, and I don't really find them to be, I don't mean to be insulting, but I don't find them to be all that relevant in the LSAT world. And Katzman is no longer associated with them. But they talked to Katzman and he brought in two henchmen to kind of talk through it. And <laughs> the discussion of the LSAT in that podcast is, or at least strategy, is really laughable. And I don't think I'm being too harsh. At one point, the guy tells Gladwell, go through this and find the two worst answers out of the five in each one of the problems. You know what? I saw this posted somewhere where someone was talking about that. I, I, my, my eyes are rolling probably out of my head at this point. Yeah. And so Gladwell does that. And then what does the guy say? Okay, you've done the hard work. And then <laughs> don't quote me on that. It's really close to that. But it is something like you, the hard part is over. You've done the hard part. Yeah. I haven't listened to it in, in at least 10 days. And I remember looking at my phone, which was playing this podcast and being like, what the, Yeah. the hard part is over? No, the hard part isn't getting rid of the two worst answers. Right. That's the easy part. The hard part is deciding between the right answer and the second best answer. Yeah. I've never harvested apples, but if I thought the <laughs> hardest part of the job was the lowest hanging fruit, I'd be really <laughs> terrible at that job. <sighs> Nicely done. Well, I mean, uh, that's just ridiculous. There's almost always a couple of garbage answers. Now, if you said, find the two best answers, then maybe we're getting someplace. Yeah. It's not so much finding the best answers. A lot of students are really good at that. It's determining which right. of those two is actually oh, right. This is not the full adventure, but it is yeah, a step. One of the biggest complaints and concerns of students is, I'm always choosing the wrong answer. I get it and down to two. And pick, yeah. 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 I was close. And that's the worst thing because you don't get points for being close on the LSAT. You just get another wrong answer. So, for them to have given that advice and then for him to trumpet it as if it was somehow useful, I just was like, come it's on. a revelation. Yeah. So, I really felt like writing him a letter and saying like, the next time you want to talk about the LSAT in a serious way and talk about how you can improve on it, why don't you talk to somebody who actually knows something about it? I think you might be giving him more credit than he deserves here as though this was some longer term endeavor. Yeah. And not a publicity stunt. You're right. And also, those guys are in New York, and it was really easy for him to access them. And, you know, Katzman's a, a reasonable size name in test preparation if you have any history with it. So, uh, that's my full comment on that. Great yeah. to listen to. Take away what you can from it that's really positive. Ignore any discussion of actual LSAT approaches. Because Strategies. The, yeah, the one that they talk about is laughably... It's just laughable. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. It's wild. Let me circle back really quick, not to linger on this too long, but uh, we talked about the speeded nature of the LSAT. And I thought you made a really interesting point about, you know, you do want lawyers who can operate consistently, efficiently, basically. Has LSAC ever tried to defend the tight time limits on this via that that you know of? Via... Via the idea of, like, we're trying to make lawyers who can accomplish complex tasks as quickly as possible. I don't think in that specific way, although I think their their point is, is that you do need to process information quickly as an sure. attorney. And so that's putting people under pressure, in their opinion, reveals certain things about their overall inclination and ability. Gotcha. And there is the valid point that... I agree that with when that, you, by the way, to a, yeah, to a certain extent. To an extent. Yeah. Um, if you're going to go into, say, a wartime situation, you want somebody who thinks well under pressure. So if you were training soldiers, you're going to train them in a certain way. The LSAT is certainly not war, maybe war for the mind, but it, they're, they're making a point about what they want to value. And when you go to law school, you run into the same timed problem. Yeah. Law school exams have time limits on them and you have to get a tremendous amount done. So when they say the LSAT predicts first year law performance really well, well, there's a reason is because those two things are actually tied together. Gladwell's point was that once you get out of law school and you become a lawyer, those limitations disappear. And my point about the fees that you pay is, yeah. no, they don't. No, they don't. Or no, they shouldn't, <laughs> at least. Um, and let's not forget, of course, the fact that with an unlimited time on this test or an hour per section or whatever it would turn into, the bell curve would no longer be a bell. It would be a crashing wave, basically. Yeah. It would this skew is a separator everything. Factor. Yeah, it would skew everything so far to the high side that the test would lose so, like its separation abilities. 
So I'm sure that's a defense that LSAC, if they were being more earnest about things, would be like, no, we have to put time limits because we need people in the 120s and 130s. Well, the counter to that is change it from 61 scores to more. Yeah, put more questions or require, I mean, you've seen this on the GRE, a perfect score only takes you to, what, the 97th percentile, I think it is. Yeah, it's ridiculous. But I mean, the LSAT used to be on a 10 to 48 scale, so there were 39 possible scores. And towards the end of that era, this was the 80s, um, you ran into a situation where the number of perfect scores started to rise as people began preparing more mm-hmm. earnestly. Yeah, and, and with so better the, content material and stuff. Too. Yes, definitely. And so you ran into the, the test change they made in 1991. They went to the 120 to 180 scale, which has 61 different possible outcomes. So they were able to have a, a finer gradient on how they were separating people. Sure. So if the situation you're talking about was the case, they'd have to gradient it again. They'd have to create more scores and probably up the difficulty. Yeah. In certain elements. Or the question count or something. But yeah. it would be very easy for this to go to a straight one-to-one do a hundred scale or something. I mean, nobody wants to get a zero or a two on the LSAT, so I get why they've started it at one twenty. Sounds better to tell your parents, but <laughs> right? Oh yeah. But what you get on the LSAT a four? That's that, that's my standard right. line about that. Yeah. Is you can't have it started zero because <laughs> you can't tell your parents I got a three. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of scoring on sure. the LSAT, let's switch over and talk a little bit about the June 2019 test. And last time, we talked about the flash impressions that students had about the exam, uh, scale predictions, yeah. things of that nature. Really the feedback we were hearing secondhand. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Now, we've the test was just released uh, less than a week ago. We've had an opportunity to go through this. And to kind of like analyze it, calculate some things about it, and really get some impressions that are based not upon secondhand information or reports, but instead on firsthand analysis. So what's your general what's your general take on the June 2019 LSAT, the last paper test, full paper test of all time? Yeah, I thought it was a pretty nice one to to go out on. You know, as swan songs go, I thought this was a pretty pretty fair departure, frankly. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't see anything on this test where I was like, oh, that's an evil way to end it. You know? <laughs> Go out with a final dagger. Right, right, right. Like a, in the, into the back of all test takers. Firework over your shoulder into the party kind of thing. It, no virus game. That's uh, right. You know, no, it's, there was away. nothing on it where I was like, really, guys? Why? To me, and I, we did a podcast this week as well, or a podcast, a webinar this week as well. Uh, And the June test got mentioned a little bit. Mostly it was focused on July. But I made the comment in that webinar as well that I was like, this was a pretty fair exam. I thought it was pretty even-handed. I would agree with you on that. I would say it was on the easy side overall. And Usually I equate fair and easy to be not entirely synonymous, but siblings. They're close. And I know we wanted to talk about the scale later, but I'm just going to bring it up now because it's appropriate. The scale showed this. Yeah, I understand I mean, the scale now. You had a minus 10 scale on this test, which for a 102-question LSAT is very, very tight. You're looking at a situation where in the past, the tightest 102-question test had been uh, minus 11. Yeah, and, and they then the next one was that, minus 14, right? Exactly. So you had a lot of... Uh, you know, expectation that it would be on the looser side. And here to come in at minus 10 felt really kind of restrictive. For sure. And I know that when uh, I'd been talking initially about what I thought the scale might be, I was like, I can see this around minus 11. And I got a lot of flack from people who were like, no, no, it's going to be minus 12, maybe mm-hmm. more. And I was like, I'm not seeing that. So minus 10 wasn't a huge surprise to me, but I think to some people it was. Yeah, same. And I'm going to just interject a clarifying footnote here. When we talk about minus 10, minus 11, minus 14, what we mean, uh, for those who maybe are listening to this and aren't sure, is that's how many questions out of the total you can miss and get a 170. Yes. That tends to be kind of the the waterline there, the marker. It's kind of what we use to analyze top-line difficulty. Yeah, you call it's a it. benchmark of sorts. Um I think we talked the last time we did this in our prediction about, like, this could go minus 10, this could go minus 12. We'll have to see. I think the reason we shaded it maybe a little bit more to the harder side was because of how difficult some of the logical reasoning had been in September and November. 
oh, of how man. deceptively difficult. So we had a lot of students come out and be like, I felt okay last September and got destroyed. Ditto November. And by we, I mean we talked to a lot. Happily, most of our students, their expectations met reality. Yeah, I think after having looked at this test on the whole, I completely understand the minus 10 scale. There's very little on this test, and, and I'm going to speak relative to other LSATs right now, not in general. There are hard questions on this test, just like every LSAT has hard questions. But compared to some LSATs that you can go and look at, there's not the same high, high level of difficulty that you run into. And that's what a minus 10 scale told us even before taking this test. And looking at it, once I knew it was minus 10, I was like, this test is probably not full of a lot of high level, super stealth killing questions. And that really is the case. And for me, as a test taker, and I think in general for students, I don't love tests like this that have a really higher level. It's, they're relatively easy on the easier side, right. and then the scale itself is really tight. And that's because I have this theory that even if you had 100 easy questions on an LSAT, because it's so fatiguing, the typical student is going to miss a few of them. Not because they don't understand it or because, you know, it's, it's beyond their abilities. It's just that you get tired. And so 100 easy questions would have a really, really tight scale, yet a lot of people would get hurt simply because the fatigue factor would knock them down. That's why I far prefer tests that are in the middle. I don't really like... That's not what I thought you were going to say. Yeah, I've I've had this theory for a long time because I've you know obviously taught. Is this a, when you say you prefer like you sitting there taking it for a result or you for the greater good of the audience out there? The, the greater students? good of the audience. Oh, okay. I, try I was to think thinking about... purely selfishly. <laughs> What's my <laughs> ideal set? Yes, I mean if I'm taking it, I'm like make it all easy. I'll just take, make it all easy. It. What? No, no, make it as hard as you can possibly make it. We talked about how time segregates people. Difficulty does too. Sure. Make it this stuff. Give me four of the weirdest games that have ever appeared on the test. Give me something that's so strange that people are leaving the room. Yeah, but then again, now what you're talking about is you you also like a really hard test. Yes. Personally, so what you're telling personally me I don't you, wish that on people. You, unless they're really good at the test. And then I'm like, what, dude, the best okay. thing you could see is a pattern game. What you just told me is you like really easy tests and you like really hard tests. No, I don't like really words, easy tests. I like easy tests for other people. I like hard <laughs> tests for me because I know it's going to let me sort of stand out a little bit. And any good test taker should feel that way. I, you, you see, from my perspective as a test taker, I don't really care. But I'm speaking just for me. You make it hard, I'm, I feel comfortable with doing it. You make it easy, I feel like I'm going to do less work and do just as well. If it's in the middle, that's great too. But usually when I'm making predictions or discussions or recaps like this, I'm thinking about what's best for the overall pool of test takers. Yeah, which is obviously a, totally different. a more important conversation for us to probably be having. <laughs> I can step outside myself, John. Enough about uh, me. Let's talk about me. Yeah. So I think a lot of people would say, oh, give me the easiest LSAT. Yeah. But those easier LSATs always come with tighter scales. And I think that there's kind of like a built-in miss rate that people run into where it's like, I got tired and I missed a few questions at the end of these sections. And all of a sudden, because of the tight scale, they get knocked down. Yeah, that's a fair point. So, so really what you're saying is the best thing is something in the middle, a minus 12 type of scale, nothing overly crazy, nothing so easy that they have to tighten it up. Exactly. Allow a little room for error near the top. I got you. The kind Which of test is fair. Somebody, I can't argue that. Yeah. So the kind of test where people come out and they're like, okay, that was reasonable. There was definitely some difficulty and that was tough here and that was tough there. But I didn't feel like it was well beyond my capacity and it was not a walk in the park either. That middle of the road kind of LSAT is really optimal. And, and last night we talked about the July test. And <laughs> Just about to say it. And thinking that it's very likely due to a number of factors that that test will be kind of a middle of the road exam. And if you're like, what are they talking about? Go listen to the webinar. We'll yeah. Post it up a lot of places. Indeed. So from a general standpoint, that negative minus 10 scale told us that this test was on the easier side from a logical difficulty standpoint. And after having looked at it, I have to agree that it is. At least at the upper levels. There weren't a lot of questions that were just truly punishing for everyone is what that tells me. Because the scale actually kind of even back out, averaged back out down towards the mid-range. Do you know, if you look at scales, they almost all do. They all kind of come towards back 
back towards this reality of the middle where it's like there's always questions of mid-level difficulty and there's plenty of them. So this is why we end up with the bell. You and I tend to talk about LSATs as like what's happening in the 170s as being indicative of difficulty. Right. So keep that in mind. In the middle part of this, this is just like every other LSAT. It's sure. got enough difficulty where if you're scoring in the 150s, you can feel the struggle in there. Yeah. All so, this means is there were fewer questions that almost everyone missed. That's really exactly. what this tells you. Fewer extremely hard questions on this test compared to other yeah. LSATs. And That's as we really start to break saying. it down, um, I think we can reiterate that point that there's just nothing in these sections that's overwhelmingly tough or so elusive, like we saw again in a couple of tests last year, that people felt good about it and were wrong. So, you want to talk about some LR? Yes, I do, man. All right. Um, I think you've we've spent a little more time in different sections uh, individually here. I've looked at everything, but I haven't looked at LR1 quite as closely as you have, I don't think. Yeah, you and I typically will will analyze different parts of this test when we have a, to do it really quickly. And I was more focused on LR1, although I've looked at both. I've looked at the whole test at this point, obviously. But I spent more time analyzing LR1. And I'll, I'll give you my take on this section. This is a pretty favorable section. Through the first 13, 14 questions, there's very little that is what you would continue, you know, say is tricky, like what we saw last year in some of the LR. It's a mostly very straightforward. And, you know, the whole section itself is really orientated towards the first family. There's six must be true questions in here. There's a real emphasis on just like, let's get the facts out. Yeah, wasn't it 16 of the 26 total? We're yeah. all first family proof type questions, flaw, must, method, main point. You're just using the information and the stimulus to pound on the answer choices. But we've talked a lot about how September and November of 2018 have these, like, in my opinion, from a, from an LSAT teaching standpoint, these beautiful yeah. <laughs> questions that are like, whoa, that is really, really well done. I didn't feel like I was looking at that I didn't here. either. And by beautiful, really well done, I remember you and I having a conversation going through last September. And I can still hear the sounds we were both making, things like, ooh, ooh check like, it out. <laughs> oh, wow, look at D, look at D, um, which is pure nerddom. But at the same time, I didn't make any noises going through this LR. I was just like, okay. No. In fact, by the time I got to say question 12 in this section, I was like, boy, either it's going to get really hard or this is just going to kind of run itself out with a, a, a slight increase in difficulty, but nothing special. And that's really what happened. As with every LSAT, though, they are testing you on your ability to like read closely. You need to make sure that you don't get caught by traps. And we're not going to go through any individual question here and like read it out loud and right. then solve it because that would – it would be very time consuming. But every once in a while, we're going to pull in questions and maybe kind of reference them. Like a great question for me on this test in this section was mm -hmm. number seven. It's a question about a barber and an herbal enzyme compound and baldness. And to me, <laughs> we're not, I'm going to make any jokes. <laughs> not to me. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know who you're referring to. Uh, it's one of those questions where when I looked at it, I often have this reaction during LSAT. So I look at it and I think, ooh, that could be a question that people miss. Yeah. And this was one of them. And it's because they get down to the end and it's really a source attack argument. All right? It's an ad hominem that, that there's two people talking. Mm -hmm. And I got down to one of the answers and it starts off and it says, draws a conclusion about someone's motives. And this is a flaw question. And I knew exactly what was going to happen to a lot of people. That's what I was looking for. You can't attack their motives. That's a source argument. And that's true. Mm -hmm. All right. The problem is, is the rest of that answer is terrible. <laughs> and so when I end up talking to students and I look at people who did this section and I look at question number seven in the first LR and I see that they chose D yeah. when the correct answer was the one that followed it. I immediately am like, you're not reading closely. Or this yeah, you're, you're over committing. You're committing too soon. You're falling in love. Yeah. This isn't about, oh, this was so hard and, and they tricked you. You just didn't pound through this and actually apply a, a judgment and, and rationality to this. You just kind of so, oh, good. That's the one I wanted. Yeah, They're talking yeah. about their motivation. It's that like you had me at hello thing. It's like, let, yeah. let me finish. <laughs> it's it's something I say about uh, flaw and method questions is that half right and half wrong is all wrong. Yeah. 
this guy starts off and it's half right. And you're like, this sounds good. So you're halfway there. You got to bring it on home. And it doesn't. And it's the kind of thing where I'm like, anybody who missed this is going to think that was a tough question. I'm like, it's not a tough question. It's a answer choice that requires you to be judicious and yeah. read the whole thing. And of course, they put it down at D. So by then people are getting antsy. People are ready to see something mm-hmm. they like. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a good example of the kind of question that I look at and I think I would be interested to see what the stats are on this. But you can see how the test making is is pretty well done there. It's a very standard approach. And then you get to E and it doesn't talk about motives, but what it does do is properly describe a source attack here. Mm -hmm. You've got to read closely. You shouldn't miss that question. And if you did, you should be upset with yourself. Yeah. So... Sorry to say that. <laughs> well, it doesn't, use, that it doesn't use the word motives in E, but it still talks about stands to benefit kind of thing. It yeah. talks about motives, but doesn't use the word. And I think a lot of people would prephrase the word motive here, the motivation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then there they are, draws a conclusion about someone's motives. And you're like, yes, this is what I wanted, but you've got to finish it. Yeah. That's so point. I kind of felt like just going through this section, it wasn't – it. When you get to question 14 and 15, that's when I started to see a rise in difficulty. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking to myself, all right, maybe we're going to start seeing really tricky LR. But it never reaches the level of last year's LR. And it kind of, yeah, even though it's so harder, mm-hmm. it still kind of rolls through. There was another question on there that you know, when I, when I read it, it immediately made me think you have to react to these problems and understand what you're doing. It's question 16 and it's about art and uh, choosing careers and so forth. And the conclusion in that reads, it's unacceptable for one's pay to be determined by subjective evaluations of one's work. And my initial reaction was, I, I, I actually wrote a note next to this problem that says, ha ha, because <laughs> it always is subjective. Like that was my initial reaction. I was like, that's the most ridiculous advice you, anyone should get. Because yeah. Subjectivity is always a part of these things. And of course, that's exactly what happens and the correct answer is another flaw question. I'm like, your boss or whoever is in charge of giving a person a raise your is compensation. always yeah. – Yeah. They're always going to be uh, affected by those factors. And it, it, I think you know, that's a, a kind of a real world view but you can use that to inform your understanding of these problems. Just because they've said it doesn't mean you have to accept it. And then you read the, you know, that it's a flaw and you're like, yeah, there's a huge problem with this. It's, is that even realistic? I don't think so. Yeah. We talk sometimes about how much of the real world, how much of your understanding of things you can actually bring to this test safely. Would you say a statement like everyone's compensation is based on a subjective evaluation of their work? Would you say that's a real world statement that would hold true in the LSAT? It's really interesting because I was thinking about this yeah. exact idea. I was like, what if you have a pay structure that is you know, based upon the amount of time that you are with a company, you automatically get a raise? That's the one type of exception I can think of here where- but this wasn't about increase in pay. This was just pay. Yes, but it's determined by subjective evaluation. So I'm thinking about as you have your pay determined and then moving forward and increasing and so forth. So- Every time you're having pay looked at, evaluated, what have you, the only way it would not be subjective at some point in the process is if everything was so predetermined there was simply no choice. But wouldn't even the amounts be subjective? That's the problem that you run into. You can go back at some point, it was determined by humans, and so it became subjective. Right. I just don't know that there's an objective measure uh, in the way of like, you know, lifting weights or running a mile or something, things you can actually measure. Yeah. at, at a certain point, there is a subjectivity to this. Now, the answer does focus on subjective evaluation, and so they, they narrow it a little bit, but they've narrowed it appropriately. Yeah. And there's someone out there right now thinking, well, even the concept of weight is subjective. Who decided a kilogram? <laughs> even time is subjective. What's a second? A What's dollar is definitely right? subjective. So, all right. <laughs> Yeah. I th- that The rest of that section is uh, – there's some notable questions in there. I think question 18, which is about killer whales and seals and so forth. I like forth, that I think question. That's, that's a really interesting question. That to me was maybe the standout question. Question uh, 22, which is about abstract art. It's the one with the blue iris in it. I thought that was a really good question as well. Did you notice there was and, a lot about art on this test? Yeah. There were a couple questions in the other LR section too. And we were just talking about 16, which is about art, exactly. and then there's 22 that's about art. I'm great with that. I'm, a, I'm an art fan and, and enjoy that kind of thing. So, it's I'm comfortable with it. But yeah. this test has always had a lot of 
of art stuff. You know, they have questions about Veronese repainting parts of the painting and things like that. It goes way back. Anyway, I didn't think this section was all that hard. Yes, there are some hard questions in it. There are always going to be challenging questions in LR. And so overall, if you're going to go out there, you've got – you should really perform well on this. Yeah. If, if you're kind of like the person who misses five, six, or seven in LR – on average, this is a section where you really can only afford to miss three or four at most. You need to have a better performance on this. For sure. Although there were certain built-in, I think, natural selection rewards or penalties in this particular section. For instance, the fact that there are 16 of the 26 questions, like two-thirds or so of them, built around the idea of, of using evidence, evaluating things, and then describing them or making inferences. All this first family stuff. Man, if you're good at must and flaw and stuff, this section is just, a, it's t-ball. If yeah. you struggle with those ideas, this section's going to be uphill the whole time. Ditto conditional reasoning, and I know you know this. Five of the last six questions in this section, it's really a home stretch. Five of the last six had conditionality in them. Yeah, and uh, there was some formulaic stuff that we saw here, and you always see that in this test. But some of the unique structural features that you that you run into into in questions, like the titanium ink Vinland map question from years ago, that's like one of the hardest questions of all time. It's so unique that it's just unforgettable. I felt like a lot of the questions here were forgettable. Yeah. You know, we've talked about like the killer whales question. That to me was maybe the most memorable question in this section. So, yeah, if you not, sit me down tomorrow and I like describe section one, I'll be like, killer whales and art. <laughs> <That's all laughs> You'd be like, hey, it was okay. Yeah. That's not a very strong reaction to have to no. a bunch of questions. How'd you feel about section two? I liked it more. I liked it more in part because um, I thought there was a better balance of questions. In other words, there was such this lean or tilt towards first family in section one that it felt almost monotonous at times. And not to say that must and flaw are the same thing, but it does kind of require the same stance or perspective. Yeah. Section two had a much better distribution. Uh, there were, instead of however many, six maybe, second family questions in the first section, there were 11 here. Second family being help kinds of questions. So things, there were a lot of strength in um, there were some assumptions and some justify, resolve. Resolve really featured a little bit down here too, which I liked. Uh -huh. Yes. So I thought we got a much better balance. 11 second family questions helping 12 first family in this. So the majority of the questions were really kind of split. I thought that was great. Uh, and there was only one must be true question in this one, <laughs> which is, again, pretty unusual. Six, you said, in the first section, right? Yeah, and then they drained it out in the second. That's right. Yeah. They had enough. You peaked early. Must be <laughs> they were done. Uh, but there were six strengthened in this, and I think maybe two or three in the first. So you could really see the tables turn, which to me made it more interesting. It also made it a little bit more difficult because there was more variance, in a sense. I mean, take this as a just as a quick perspective, a glance at the balance of this section. There were two of main point, two parallel two-pointed issue, two justify, two resolve, and two weaken. I mean, that's just perfectly laid out. Twelve of the questions here were of six types. It's a really even distribution that you don't see very often. It's a more classically balanced section versus section one. I think that's a good way to say it. So, you know, I use the word fair towards the beginning of this. I think this is actually a more fair section in a way. It it's rewards also... and punishes a little bit more evenly. It's a harder section. But it makes it too. harder. Yeah. And I think the content was harder. Yeah, I and agree with that, actually. There were more interesting questions here. And it's, you know, Dave, it's funny. Partly this is because people saw it later in the day on their test. But partly I think it's because certain questions stand out more when they're interesting or challenging. The questions that we got reported about this test, the majority of them came from LR2. Yeah. I can now tell. Yeah, and we didn't know that at the, of course at the time of first the time. asking right afterwards. No. But I felt like this section just had more notability to it, more memorability as well. And I want to kind of make a sidebar comment. Sure. You know, if you're out there listening and you're thinking, well, shouldn't the two LR sections be equal in difficulty? Um, they're not always that way. And in fact, more often than not, one of the sections is harder than the other. Mm -hmm. And so we've had some information that LSAC had released years ago about different sections and difficulty. And we were able to kind of make an analysis. And the, the difficulty, according to them, of each 
test in its totality is medium. Right? So, but in that way, sometimes right. one LR section was kind of on the hard side and the other LR section was on the easy side. And that's how they balanced it. And they've done that a little bit here. I think section LR1 is easier and LR2 is relatively harder. Yeah, yeah. How do you get to lukewarm? Well, you could keep it that way or you can mix hot and cold. And that's a little <laughs> bit of what this felt like. Very nice. That yeah. is exactly the case. Um, let me ask you a question. If you were to choose, and I am going to make this personal for just a second, and then maybe we can talk about it, whoever's listening. <laughs> <laughs> You're in that kind of mood today, aren't you? A little you? bit. <laughs> it's all blame, about you. Blame America's drink. Uh, <laughs> if you had to pick for yourself, and then we'll talk about you, where you would want the harder of the two sections. So let's say there were going to be this stratification. Would you rather see the more difficult section first, or would you rather find a rhythm and see it later? And you're talking about me personally now. Yeah, we'll talk about you for a second. I don't care. I know you don't like to talk about yourself. Let's indulge me. It's not my favorite topic, but <laughs> I actually don't care where I see it. I take the same mindset into all these tests. I'm going to destroy every question. You are my prisoner. And that's the end of the line. So to me, it doesn't really matter. You could make an argument. <laughs> you were clearly the wrong person to ask. <laughs> Let's <laughs> I mean, clearly I I was like, why are you doing this? I uh, will say this. There are two helpful. there are two ways to look at this. Number <laughs> one, that the first LR warms you up a little bit, gets you in the rhythm. So if it's nice and it's on the easier side, that's great. Then you're really like ready to roll when you yeah. hit that second harder section. Calms your nerves, yeah, you find some momentum. Alternatively though, uh you should have more energy earlier in the test. So running into the harder section uh, earlier is going to give you a better opportunity that when you get to the later section, maybe when you're more fatigued, it's easier. Right. And so you don't suffer any kind of breakdown or mental loss of focus. It's more proportional to kind of where you are at the start. Um, yeah. So I guess it really then depends on the type of test taker you are. Are you nervous and anxious at the start? Does it take you a while to get going? And hope the easy stuff is early. Um, are you fast and furious right out of the gate, but you tend to fade out near the end? Hit me with the hard stuff right away. Exactly. Yeah. I won't, by the way, I just saw this on Reddit the other day, so I'll bring it up very quickly. I won't apply that to individual section kind of approaches or strategies. There was a post on Reddit where I saw someone was like, I do better at LR if I start at the end and work backwards. Mm. I'm like, man, look, I'm all for experimentation. That's the only reason I went to college. But, (laughs) (laughs) but... This is one of those experiments that I think is almost destined to fail, mm. much like college probably should be. It's funny. I went to college to get out of the house, get away, <laughs> get freedom. I guess that was part of it too. I, I needed freedom for my experimentation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. But yeah, that's one of those things where it's like, well, if I feel strong early, shouldn't I hit question 25, then 24, then 23? Like, Bring on no. the tough stuff. It's like, man. Do not do that. No. I mean, again, experiment. Try it for a section or two and see what happens. But I think on the whole, that's just terrible, terrible. Well, the only problem with that is if you only try it for a section or two, your sample is so limited that you might get a false false reading. Yeah. Yeah. You get a false reading out of it. I will tell you right now that on average, on I can't even, I don't think there's any exceptions to this. The first 10 questions on the LSAT of an LR section are generally easier than the last 10 questions. So going backwards strikes me as a very foolish idea. Get the low-hanging fruit out of the way. Get a good feeling for the section so that when you encounter the harder questions, you're ready and you already have a bank behind you where you're like, I'm doing okay. Yeah. Try to so. find your two worst answers <laughs> and you're almost done. Ugh, oh, that's going to stick with me for a while. It, it, it has stuck with me for a long time already. <laughs> well, let me tell you what else has stuck with me. Let me point out a couple of questions in this section that I thought were either interesting or presented some unique challenge. One of the ones that I know you and I kept hearing was cheetah. Cheetah, cheetah. cheetah. Um, cheetah. Which surprises me a little bit once I've looked at the test because this was only question four. It's so early. Yeah. Usually when we hear about questions, it's like, guys, I was really stuck between two, or does anyone know how to solve this thing about, you know, whatever, whales. But in this case, question four, and it really stumped a lot of people. It was a resolve question and a great one. You know what it instantly, instantly reminded me of, Dave, is something we talk about with resolve a fair amount, a high-level idea, uh, about if the nature of the paradox is based on two things being similar when you wouldn't expect it, or two things being different when you wouldn't expect it. In other words, man, that's odd that those would go together. Well, that's odd that these would be apart. Then you have to explain that similarity or that difference with the same type of information. Similarity is needed in an answer choice. 
uh, a joining together is needed to explain these things being together in the stimulus. And in this case, the cheetah was an outlier. It was a standalone element or event. And what did you do? You had to find an answer choice that describes the cheetah as being unique in some way. And that's exactly what it did. The difference matched the difference, as it were. Yeah. You can't explain a similarity with a difference, and you cannot explain a difference with a similarity. Yeah. And so here you had a difference. And so you needed something that was going to be showing that difference. A, sec- and the- a separator, basically, a wedge yeah. to split. Yeah. And that's exactly what the correct answer did. It focused in on the idea of like, well, what makes it different? Mm-hmm. I think that you know people got caught by that a little bit because they didn't expect it to all of a sudden focus in on hunting strategy. Yeah. And I'm trying not to give too much away about right and wrong answers. I know you are too. I don't want to spoil this. Uh, no, I'm not trying. Too- okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> one of us, one of us is looking out for you out there. Um, there's a lot of people who haven't taken the test yet and may inadvertently stumble across this. So I just want to make sure we don't give too much away. But then again, where's the fun in keeping all this stuff? To yeah, us? I want to talk about it, man. <laughs> so one of the things I liked about this section, and it leads me to another question that I thought was great here, is that there was a, at least if you knew what you were doing, like that cheetah question and the similarity difference thing in Resolve, there were a lot of questions that fit beautifully into that type of strategic approach, into a very predictable technique. Uh, another one that I really liked, and there were actually two good flaw questions in this section, both of which presented reasonably classic flaws. Classic flaws were if people had actually listened to our prediction stuff for March, for June, I touched on both of these and what to expect. One was that classic composition division error, where the part to whole thing, you can't try to mix and match, go up and down. Question seven was about honey oats, this cereal. Mm-hmm. Honey oats have a healthy ingredient, so honey oats must be healthy to eat. Mm. Part to whole, you can't do it. I think I made the analogy to you earlier of like, yeah, my double cheeseburger has tomatoes on it. Tomatoes are good for you. <laughs> Look at my uh, diet. Yeah. Look at me. Not mine. I don't like tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, you can't do that part to whole. And then another question later, 19, had another flaw with the use of evidence thing. Just because the evidence is bad or just because the reasoning behind something's bad doesn't mean the argument's wrong. So these are two very classic things. I've told students for months and months to look out for those two. Look at me go. You were right on the money with that. Sometimes. And the, the test always will test classic errors. Mm-hmm. It's in their wheelhouse. It's easy question making. And it is something they expect people to know. So they're going to test you. A lot of what happens on the LSAT is, okay, we expect you to know this. Do you know it? Mm-hmm. And this is a great example of that. Both the questions that you mentioned, 7 and 19, you can s- expect these to show up in yeah. some form or another. And so it shouldn't have been any surprise. This is the kind of question I think, John, where really good test takers just annihilate the question. Oh, yeah. And yeah, that cheetah question is 30 seconds, 40 seconds. They're just flying through. Seven, you see it, and you're like, I know this composition division. Kill it. Yeah. Yeah, just like the source argument that I talked exactly. about on the last one. Yeah, it's exactly You've got to watch right. out for the answers, but at well, least you know what you're looking for. You just have to make sure you found it. So That's right. Yeah. Uh, right in the middle of the section, it was just a question I liked. It was uh, another one we heard a lot about pilots, pilots on some like low-calorie diet. Uh, and what I thought was funny about this is it equated a low-calorie diet to having a couple drinks of alcohol. And it said they performed on their diet about as well as pilots who'd had a few drinks. It's crazy. Like, what do you know? First of all, why are they letting pilots drink um, <laughs> or diet? I assume this was like a simulator. <laughs> I just thought that was a fun question. It was another resolve question, too, where four answers resolved. It was an accept. I thought that was kind of interesting. And some of the reasons that they gave, of course, fit right into that resolve template that we talked about. Exactly. Um, a couple more. The only assumption question in the section was question 15 about this glee club, club party who wouldn't pay for supplies early to save some money. And the only must question, one I really liked and that you and I have disagreed a little bit about, was question 24. This was about city buses and bike lanes and whether they could drive down certain streets. I love this question, by the way. I like this question quite a lot as well. Uh, Where we disagree is not on our affection. (laughs) It's on our labeling. Um, (laughs) I called this just conditional reasoning. You were more inclined to label it and not more inclined. You were insistent on labeling it formal logic. Yeah, it is. Yeah, well, I see you've softened. <laughs> you see that I've suddenly changed my viewpoint, not. Yeah. How reasonable of you. 
Uh, you know what I like about this question is that uh, one of our students, Lauren, uh, wrote me a message and she was like, I crushed that question yeah. because of like all the stuff I learned from Power Score. And That's I'm, fantastic. And honestly, it's question 24. If you can start, keep, I guess, crushing questions there, you got to be feeling good. Yeah. And I, that question to me is beautiful because as soon as I had read it and I just made a, a quick mini diagram of it, I was like, it's going to probably be this or this. And then sure enough, you get that. Or just a couple of inferences you could draw in absolutes. And the yeah. fact that it never qualified the language to a most or a sum or a not all, that's why I didn't call it formal logic. But if you want to keep formal logic at the level of absolutes and pure conditionality, I'll throw you a bone. You please do that, you know. <laughs> I'd actually appreciate that. That's all you can get. The way I looked at it was you got a, an arrow statement and then you have two double knot arrows coming off of it. All right. So that's an arrow and two double knot arrows. There's a bunch of inferences there. That's formal logic to me. Yeah, so I don't really use double knot arrows. So that's fine. I think that's probably wrong in the grand schematic of the world. Maybe to not see things that way, but whatever. Maybe. Well, I, when I say I don't do them, I do them in some places. Certain rules in games. Several rules on this test, in fact. So you do use them. Yeah, in a situation okay. like this. Just 24. making sure that we're clear. Yeah, I'm not like allergic. <laughs> <laughs> you just said, I don't use them, and I'm like... I meant more in a situation like false. this. If I had a line of conditional reasoning, I wouldn't use double knot errors, uh, typically. It completely destroys this question. How could you not? I didn't diagram this question. Well, no. Then you and I differ on that's, that that's point. That's how I could not. I diagram very little in general until I run into something like this. I will like say, if anybody out there struggles a little bit with like conditional chains and diagrams or a bit of formal logic at this level, uh, this is a great question. Go ahead and write write yourself a post-it note. Stick it somewhere when you get a copy of this test. 24 and LR2, it's fantastic. It's a great question, and it's the kind of question that is tailor-made for diagramming, that when you do this, you completely control the information. If you know inference-making, you can quickly make the inferences and then just go right to the right answer for the most part. I agree. I think it's it's a almost like a a perfect look at how you would want to do a question like this. Yeah. Well, so, to, to be fair to me, I was looking at this on my phone and didn't have a pen or a pencil. So That's, okay, whatever. I mean, so I didn't diagram it. <laughs> oh, no, I, I understand got it right. that now. <laughs> uh, well, how come these there exceptions always come out after the fact? Well, where's after the, you've where's made the fun this? In, yeah, where's the fun in hedging up front? <laughs> You made an absolute statement. No, I just don't do it. I'm like, what? That's not true. And then we find In out. In situations yeah. like this, I know. I speak with a lot of asterisks. Um, <laughs> you speak with a lot of absolutes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But that's LR. Um, again, I think LR2 is a little more fun, but also a little more challenging. Yeah, I actually liked those questions that you mentioned. I love question 14 in this section as well. This is the one about the spiders and, and, and uh, Oh, Guam. yeah, Guam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really liked that question and, and the way that it actually worked. For me, I felt great about the causality with it. I could see where it was going. Yeah. Uh, but it's still kind of like a unique thing. And as I understand it, that is actually true. Really? Uh, about Guam, yeah. So the I, introduction I, of the brown tree snake and it yeah. eliminated a bunch of the bird species. How about that? There's another uh, conditional question on this section, number 16, that really jumped out to me. This is about a novelist being yeah. popular. And it turns out it's a cannot be true question. Mm -hmm. The and only one on the test. Yeah. And it's the kind of question that to me, if you were taking the LSAT for the first time, you would really struggle with a question like this. Mm -hmm. But if you've been studying in the right way and you know the concepts cold, it's the kind of question where you hit it, you see the relationship, and again, I diagram this one too. And as I said, I don't diagram a tremendous amount in LR, but when I have like heavy conditional and there's uh, a compound Jeez. necessary condition here, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and, and just put it down so I don't have to think about it anymore because to be honest, I'm lazy. And as a test taker, I'm like, wrote it down, don't need to think about it. Yeah. It's there. And immediately when I saw the cannot be true, I was like, it has to be – this or this. And yep. no matter what, the, the answer has got to deal with popularity. It's either popular or not popular in a certain configuration. And two of the answers don't even mention popularity. So I just scanned the answers and I was like, well, those two are gone. And then I looked at the three remaining answers that do have popularity, found the one that matched what I wanted, and I was off to the races. Mm -hmm. But this is a great separating question. If you're able to score in the 170s, you can do a question like this really fast. Whereas if you're not, you're probably slower on this and it takes more time. You might not clearly understand the concept. 
question 16 for me is the kind of snapshot question that I would give to somebody to say, let me test you yeah. and see where you are at. It's a good you separator can, question, really, a litmus yeah. test question. Well, if someone came to me and said, you know, I, I think I'm really good at LR, I'd be like, just do this question and do it in under a minute and then explain it to me and get it right from a conceptual sure. strategic approach. And if somebody's like, well, it's kind of tough, I'd be like, it is not tough if you see this test from a certain level. And I realize, once again, that you and I are not – the best representatives in terms of this because we do do this professionally and we look at LSATs all day long and explain this. But to me as a teacher, which is really my focus here, it's like go out, make sure you understand this because if you don't get this question instantly and understand the structure and the possible answers before you even read them, it means you're not up to speed to where you should be. Right. Or at least there's opportunity to keep growing because you're yeah. clearly – Again, that sounded kind of harsh. I'm usually not the harsh guy. Usually you. Yeah, no. uh, <laughs> I'm usually the me. benevolent guy, but yeah. there are times when I'm talking about LSAT questions where I'm like, <laughs> absolutely not. You know, you cannot allow that to happen. I get much more emphatic when I'm talking about actual questions and right and wrong answers. And, and well, I think that attitude translates well when other people adopt it. And I think that's part of the reason that we talk in such aggressive terms at times about this test. It's like, attack it. Destroy this thing. Be, exactly you know, right. be aggressive. Be proactive. Get mean. That that's the real approach you have to have, especially against a test that's playing as many psychological games as this one does. You yeah. really got to like steel yourself against all instances of potential weakness, vulnerability. You really do. And I'm all for flexibility and being adaptable and understanding that things can go right or wrong and, and, and kind of reacting appropriately to that. But when I'm reviewing tests and I look at how people have performed, I'm going to get hardcore about it. I'm like, uh-uh. There are misses that I understand and there are misses that I won't accept with, yeah. when I'm working with students. And that's just a standard you have to hold people to. If you're gonna if you're gonna create greatness, you have to actually have a standard that says you've got to perform at a high level. Yeah. So I couldn't agree more. Um, but I think the second LR section allowed for a little more of that greatness demonstration. It did. There's much more uniqueness in this. There's a few questions, like I said, that I think we both really like quite a bit. And, yeah. And I like sixteen them. as well. Um, and obviously the standalone cannot makes it interesting just on that you know on that fact alone so yeah well notice what happened in this section once we got into like the teens we started to find these questions like 13 14 16 yeah you know 15 that were like these are really interesting questions it was just a more engaging section in terms of difficulty yeah the other thing that's the last thing i'll say about it anyway is that too. <laughs> The final 10 or so questions, or final eight questions maybe, started to get really abstract, really esoteric. Uh, you had things about like, movie critics believe that sentimentality detracts from aesthetic value. And there was one about, uh, in a democracy, public art should bring people together. Or, I mean, you had a bunch, obviously money helps one satisfy one's desires. However, mm. people become less happy as they become more wealthy. And it's like, oh, Jesus. It was just one after another. Like this. I mean, now granted, there was that 24 that was very deliberate and kind of hardcore, but you had a lot of this fluffy language, very abstract stuff. It started to feel intangible. And I know for yeah. a lot of people, that's it's tiring. as anything intangible would be. It's shaky ground, you know. No, it tires you out to read that kind of stuff it does. over and over again. It does. Yeah, give me some subject matter. Tell me about Guam. Well, let's move to reading comprehension. Cool. That was a lengthy discussion of LR, longer than yeah, I think that was we intended. Probably more than we. <laughs> More than we needed. <laughs> but we oh, learned a lot about each other. Yes, we did. <laughs> we learned that I am generally flexible and benevolent in life, but when teaching the LSAT and talking about questions, Absolute I am a hardcore dictator. hardline. <laughs> and I'll accept that. Mussolini. Let's go. All right, let's get into RC. So, again, I, I found this section personally to be very fair. I think a lot of people would say this was the hardest section of the test. I thought it and was. I feel like that had a lot to do with the fish farming passage yeah, being a little bit difficult. So let's just talk about each of the passages here. So it opens up with a passage that I found really interesting I to like read. I like this too. Yeah, it was, it's enjoyable. And it's always the case that if as a student you can enjoy what you're reading, you will naturally perform better on it. So hopefully the people out there are movie fans. Um, and this discussion made a whole lot of sense. I really thought it was kind of cool when they were kind of going through this, like the subtitling and the dubbing and yeah. 
the yeah. little logo. Well, there were two so moments it, early that grabbed me, and I was like, ah, I like this. The first was just the first sentence. Where it was like writing on the subject of motion pictures, and I was like, all right, I can get into a movie passage. Yeah. And then the first line of paragraph two, I don't know why this phrase grabbed me, but I dig it. It says, <laughs> in the process of distribution, a film can be mutilated in many ways. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Harsh. I know. You no, know, what's notable about that is, is you rarely see language that forceful. That's, I think that's what caught my eye. I was like, oh, here we go. I think I, I was just reading something <laughs> in the Reading Comprehension Bible where it's like authors rarely go into that kind of forceful level of language. It's usually a lot more neutral because they're trying to sound scholarly. Yeah. And when you're trying to sound scholarly, you usually do not speak in extremes. Yeah. So you get mutilated, for instance. Yeah, mutilated. Well, you get that these questions like author's tone, right? And you could just instantly eliminate things like, you know, overly ecstatic or the author's tone was <laughs> utter dismay. Mutilation doesn't leave you with a whole lot of options in terms of tonality. No, it doesn't. But I thought it was a very cool passage. Uh, overall, six questions. That's what I like to see if you're going to have an easy passage. Give me at least six or seven. Yeah. I don't want to see an easy passage with only five because you're not getting a whole lot of bang for the buck of time that you're spending reading right. the passage. So I don't even think there's a whole lot to talk about here. It yeah. felt like a great start to this section. I agree. Part of what made it great for me, though, is something that I do think is uh, an attitude or mindset that students would do well to adopt as soon as possible. And that is, if you enjoy a passage, you will typically perform better on it. But you need to find a way to enjoy every passage. You just have to play this little... For me, what I do is this like psychological thing where as soon as I'm about to read a passage, no matter what it's on, I get into it, see the topic, and I'm like, interesting. I'm going to learn something. We're like, I bet this wins me bar trivia one day or something. Like, I immediately try to turn it into a, just a, a learning exercise. You can't do this in logic games. But at least in reading comp, you have the ability to walk away a little more knowledgeable about something. So if you can turn this into a, a situation where you're like, you know what? I'm into this. Immediately it translates into not only better reading and a more efficient movement through the passage, but you just feel more comfortable, I think. You totally do. And look at some of the crazy weird facts that you would learn, like the Guam passage we were just talking about. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And they, I mean, people ask me this in class sometimes. There's that question about like, you know, Pluto was discovered in 1930. People are like, is this stuff real? Or are they just pulling facts out of their, you know, <laughs> it's real. collective Newton ass? And I'm like, no, that's actually real. Like, <laughs> discovered by Clyde Tombo, in fact, at the uh, Lowell Observatory, I think. Well, there you go. Yeah. More facts for uh, everybody. Yeah. So the motion picture, beautiful soft landing to this section. Everybody had to feel pretty good after reading that. The questions, I don't, I didn't feel like I was getting hammered or anything like that. Yeah. I thought they were pretty straightforward. So then you go to the fish farming passage. And it was interesting because I heard a lot about this after the test. And so when I arrived at this passage, I was like, good, let's see what we've got here. And I think this is probably the hardest passage uh, of this exam. Is it classically like among the you know the top 15 or 20 hardest ever? I wouldn't say so. No. I do think my initial thought on this passage was that it was hard to read somehow. And I found that for the most part, with the exception, I think, of like the third paragraph, it it's not too bad. The third paragraph looks hard because it's got some, you know, statistics in there and numbers. And I think a lot of students when they were reading were like, ah, I don't like this and it doesn't feel comfortable. Yeah. But man, the, the gist of that third paragraph is really just that the farmed fish eat more food yeah. than do the wild fish. I was yeah, like, it talks about amino away, acids and stuff. It's, yeah. yeah, lycopene and, and stuff like that. Lysine, methionine. Yeah. Yeah, lycopene's in a different question. It is. That was an LR question. <laughs> That's an LR question. <laughs> a lot of peens on this test. A lot of I'm, I'm not looking at this passage right now. So <laughs> I, I cut got... you off. You were saying if you can take away from this. Yeah, I was getting amino acids confused. <laughs> but if you can take away the idea that the, the farmed fish just happen to eat more food relative to the wild fish, you've probably gotten a lot of what you need. Now, the questions are, I think, are harder on this passage than, than all the others. And I think that's where the real difficulty came in when you get to it. There were also and eight, so when, eight questions here. Yeah, and that was another thing that was yeah. a huge problem is like it just kept pounding you over and over again. But when you have a third paragraph like that, you know they're going to ask you about that. You just take away the big picture and then come back to it. Mm -hmm. Come back and look at it when, when you finally get that question that does ask you to answer that. So lots of questions. I felt the questions were hard on this. I can understand the struggle here 
overall. But I think it's a really good representative, uh, harder than average passage. And so when you're in there reviewing, this is the kind of passage you really want to sit down and say to yourself, what could I do next time on a passage like this that would make me control it better, understand it better? Uh, could I read it differently? You know, could I approach the questions differently? Or am I just stuck and this is going to be tough no matter what? You know, try to see what kind of takeaways actually exist there. Yeah, and that takeaway might come on your third or fourth reading. There might be something that clicks where you're like, oh, you know what? I see this connection now. Or, oh, you know what? I could have just skipped over this part. But spend some exactly. time actually immersed in this stuff until it at least starts to feel, if not comfortable, at least manageable to the extent. If I saw this again, I could do better with it. I could bring uh -huh. some strategy to the table. Agreed. Yeah. So, again, understand the concerns about this passage. I can see missing questions here, and this is not where I would hardline somebody. If they're like, all right, I missed three questions in fish farming, I'd be like, all right, I understand why that happened. So, that tells you a little bit about like the way I perceive this in terms of difficulty. This, is, is, this was hard. Yeah. It's regrettable, too, because I know a lot of people come to this thinking, I'm only going to do three passages. I need to pick the right ones. And one strategy that often then is brought to bear is I'm definitely going to do the passage with the most questions. Yeah, and then you've walked into doing the hardest. It turns out, yeah. <laughs> that does happen. So, to have the hardest passage with the most number of questions is, uh, you know, a jerk move by LSAC. <laughs> I think that's actually pretty polite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was going to say something a lot harder. Probably in reference to Rick and Morty and bird culture, but... <laughs> I let that go. In bird culture, this is considered a right. jerk move. <laughs> we'll keep it uh, safe for work. There you go. Anyway, we move on to the third passage. And again, we come back to a discussion that I thought was pretty cool. And whereas the first two passages were about humanities, the third one, and the second humanities passage slash, is humanities yeah, yeah. with some sciencey stuff in there. If somebody said that's science, I could understand it. Now we come to a law passage and they're talking about false testimony and, and focusing on accomplices who were witnesses, mm -hmm. as well as my favorite jailhouse, jailhouse informants. informants. Yeah, I like that too. <laughs> and I immediately thought this is actually enjoyable to read. And if you're... It, you know, you're taking the LSAT, you're a prospective lawyer, you should enjoy this. Yeah. If you read this passage and thought this sucks, you are not going to like law school. So, <laughs> think about like your, your choices if you fall into that camp. But I think that very few people would read this and not find it at least somewhat interesting. So, yeah, I didn't... we're using all of these terms obviously relative to LSAT reading comp. Totally. I, is, yeah. yeah. There's many other things in the... I, in the... Yeah, I've got a library <laughs> of world. things I'd rather read. <laughs> about a million different things. But as far as LSAT reading comprehension, I enjoyed both the first and third passages quite a bit. I didn't hate the second one, um, but I also didn't find it hugely engaging. But anyway, coming back to this, it's it's like anything. You can learn a little bit about the law. You can learn a little bit about the way people see things uh, in the world. And that, to me, makes this very kind of interesting. It has seven questions, which I found to be pretty good. I thought yeah. overall with the difficulty of the questions and the difficulty of the passage was about medium. So, you fair. start off easy, then you go harder with fish farming. Now, you drop back down in difficulty. This seemed pretty reasonable. If someone came to me and said, I missed like four out of the questions, I'd be like, okay, we need to focus on this because you shouldn't miss that many on this passage. I'm not saying that it's easy because I don't think that it is, but I also don't think it's so killer or has such a terrible topic or is unreadable that you should be missing the majority of questions. Yeah, nor did the questions feel all that you know, overwhelming to me, at least. No. And again, when I say that, I'm talking about anybody scoring like say 150, 155 or above. Right. You right. Want to, you and when I say they felt you know, accessible to me or whatever, gettable to me, what I mean is I could see through the eyes of what I feel like would be the average student. I didn't see anything here where I'm like, oh man, that's a dick move. Yeah, and you come out, out of the out of the gate and you get the classic main point. You get a good yeah. feel for this. It moves on. There's a couple must-be-trues that are floating around and they're just like always – and really everything in that – in this set is all must-be-true. Sure. The whole thing is just like as usual with reading comprehension. What did you read and what do you know? Yeah, so, yeah. function of the final paragraph is pretty straightforward according to the third paragraph and it sends you there. And we'll talk a little bit about these uh, specific references back to the passage, maybe at the end of the section, because I think it's interesting what we've noticed them doing here. Yeah, let's let's save that one because yeah, I think it is I a 
Good point. We'll get to the last passage, which I thought, again, was in the middle, although I can see where this could be a little bit tricky. And this is the Grio passage. Yes, I got the pronunciation correct. No, you nailed it. You know, the, I remember our discussion last time. I was waiting for griots. <laughs> or griot, but griots. it is grio. And this is the comparative reading passage. And again, it's about humanities. And passage A is about blues musicians in, the, in, in America versus, say, West African grio. And I thought it was kind of an interesting discussion, like the, the larger connection to society, how you fit in, what you say, what it reflects. I actually enjoyed reading it. Uh, the second passage is, I think, more specific. It's in about a very uh, specific time frame and culture, the Wolof culture, where they talk about these griots. And uh, you can see that's the common theme is, is the griot aspect. I didn't find the second passage as enjoyable, but it's really kind of short. And so it wasn't that it was painful. It was just like, all right, now they're talking about a specific version of it. And so a lot of stuff about culture and where the griots stand within these various cultures and then connecting that back to the blues musicians in passage A. Yeah. yeah. I noticed that too in looking at it. I was like, man, that's 10 lines shorter. Passage yeah. B. This is also a passage that people have trouble describing afterwards. And I think the reason is, is it's very sprawling. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of different elements. West Africa... Grio, blues musicians, America, Senegal, 15th century, stratification Portuguese of society. explorers, yeah. Yeah. It's like, whoa. Jeez. <laughs> Hold on, guys. Which explains, again, in looking back at what we heard on test day, I heard probably five different descriptions of this passage, I'd say. Mm -hmm. That's my over-under. I know I heard blues and griots and West African musicians. and Yeah. So, you're right. This was definitely... It felt like an odd sock drawer of topics in a way. Yeah, and again, full of must-be-true questions. Six questions on this passage. So there's never a break. This whole section has 27 questions. It's a long section. And that's part of the difficulty because if you were to take this last passage set and do it on its own, I would say most people perform decently. I'm so. not saying they're going to be perfect. But to put this at the end of the test and it's a 27-question test, uh, you know a lot of people ran out of time. Sure. Which is unfortunate because they're, you know, they're just, they're probably like, I understood this, I can relate to it, but I just don't have time to get through all the questions. Yeah. Well, I'm sure a lot of people got so bogged down in passage two about fish that that was just the end of it. Yeah. And that's a great example of, of how a passage like the fish farming can get you. You just try to get every little detail and there's some real details in there and you lose so much time. Never get bogged down in the details when you're doing reading comprehension. Get the yeah. big picture, come back and worry about the details when you were asked about them. For sure. It's that quicksand moment. They put it pretty early here. They really did. And I think that contributed to everyone feeling like, oh, this section was hard, in part because they, would, they were running out of time. And anytime right. that occurs, you automatically associate that with high difficulty. Again, I think that the overall logical difficulty in a vacuum is about middle of the road on this section. I think some of the questions are hard, certainly, but when you add the length of the section and the placement of that hard passage, it becomes a little harder than average. Yeah, I was about to say, I could make this section a whole lot easier if you let me shuffle the passages. Oh, yeah. Run me a one, three, four, two alignment, yeah. and we'd be in great shape. I agree. So... I like the section overall. I think it's pretty representative of what they do. It's it's middle of the road, but it is on the harder side as opposed to the easier side. And this is one of the areas where the difficulty in this test came from. But we got 102 questions. And at this point, you've had two sections of LR that were 26. And you've had now this 27 question section. You get, there's a lot of work to get through. And yeah. this RC it's reflects bulky. that perfectly. I will say uh, an easier RC section here. I think we'd have had like a minus eight. So. In part, I'm glad that this was a little bit tough. You're exactly right about that. They had to make this section harder on average to offset, say, LR1 and certainly the opening stanzas of the Logic Game section. It's a nice way to put it. So, on that note, let's one, talk one about... other feature about reading comp. Oh, that's right. Sorry, yeah, my no, bad. No, I know. <laughs> um, I think you and I have just gotten so accustomed to seeing it looking at digital tests that yes. uh, it's, it's easy to forget that this is somewhat novel. Uh, and that is, for those wondering what in the hell I might be talking about, if you look back at passages, really the last September, what, almost 20 some odd years prior, 
when the test makers would refer to some either quote or idea, something in the passage, they'd always use the line reference to tell you where to look. They've stopped doing that. Specifically, they've stopped doing it for the digital test because the passages on the digital test no longer have line references. The reason why is you can take the text and expand and contract it visually, and there's no way for the line references to really track that well. Or the questions to refer to line references as the text moves because it's going to move to different lines, and that wouldn't make sense. So what they do on the digital test, instead of line references, is they put a highlight on the element in the question stem, and then a similarly colored highlight in the passage to that element. So it's very visual. You can track things that way. And then they tell you roughly where to look. So in the first half of paragraph three, the author uses the phrase griots to mean on the digital test they highlight it, on the passage it would be highlight, and you could see it pretty clearly. You might have to scroll to find it on digital, but it's there. What they've started to do in reading comp now, and really last November we saw some of this, this test completely, they've removed all line references from the questions. So, let me see if I can actually find... Yeah, the, and the, the passage itself this. has the line references still, but in the question stems, they aren't saying, in line 15... When That's right. You know, Instead, they, they say things like, which one of the following is closest in the meaning of, and this is fishy, the phrase, quote, relieving pressure on ocean fisheries, as used in the middle of the first paragraph. So now it's uh, basically a hunt. you got to go find that quote. Mm -hmm. Now, on the digital test, it'll be highlighted for yeah, you. Yeah, there's a highlighter there. In most cases. So it, you can see them starting to shift at what they're doing in preparation for this transition that's about to happen here in July. So I, I'm glad you, you did bring that up yeah. and that you, you halted my headlong rush towards LG. <laughs> well, I don't blame your rush, but <laughs> uh, but it is interesting. You can see they're starting to really prepare these tests in advance to become digital versions of themselves. Exactly. And to get students used to this idea of like, we weren't even using line references then. What are you worried about? Yeah, although they have been. Uh, they used one question in November. They used seven last September. They used none this time. So clearly they're phasing this out for a reason. Well, if you recall, it was last November when they said, hey, we're going to do this. So the they digital probably thing? Were like, yeah. yeah. They're probably like, what? We better start changing. <laughs> you know, we could have used that Keen song about everybody's changing. Such foresight. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So but with let's, that, let's move. Yeah. Yeah. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's hit the <laughs> logic games, baby. Got to like it. Ah, uh, well, you really got to like it when you look at the first couple. Man, I'm telling you, game number one is one of the easiest logic games of the last 20 plus years, without question to me. Six variables, uh, you know, built on a basic linear base, but it's mostly sequential rules and then just a rotating block. It's really easy to capture the rules. It's pretty easy to see how the limitations, especially with that um, that last rule about the judges and lawyers going around the police officers. And of course, you have to understand that the police officers is really a group of two because the nurses are there. Yeah. It's this rotating this, block, right? Again, this test showed a beautiful soft landing to start the section. They did it in reading comp. They've done it here in logic games. We certainly saw that in logical reasoning yeah. as well. There was nothing that was like, here's a punch in the mouth. This is kind of like a caress <laughs> across your back. It's like, thank you. I just, when I did the setup to this game, I was like, oh boy, this doesn't seem to have a whole lot of options. Am I about to get hit with a whole bunch of extra added information in the questions? And that didn't really happen. It was just so straightforward. There's only five questions though. And that's kind of like what they're they're counter is here. Right. It's like, we're going to make this incredibly easy, but we're only going to ask you five questions. Yeah. Their generosity has a ceiling to be sure. But this was, I mean, I can't imagine a better start to a section for the typical person out there. Yeah. And I'll, I'll refrain from further comment on this because I'm going to talk about the first two games in tandem. Let's go to the second game. Sure. Which is a game about commercials and a tele television station <laughs> advertising products. Now, what do you have? wait a second, this looks almost like the same thing I just had. I've got a bunch of sequential rules and a rotating block. Have they made a mistake and somehow put the same game twice in a row? And now there's only five variables. Yeah, It's gotten even less than it was before. And there's not even the crazy rule that we had where it's like, you know, this guy's between the, the two others. 
or some kind this- of conditional sequencing thing. There's just none of that here. I, I couldn't believe it. I literally was like, my my actual reaction to the setup to the second game was this could be straight from our course or the Logic Games Bible and the mini drills that we talk it about. Looks exactly like. Logic Games Bible mini drills is what this setup looks like. It's just literally two little sequences. That's it. Yeah. And by little, I mean three variables in one, two variables in the other. You know, rotating block ahead of T and yeah. then P's ahead of G. That's, That's it. it. I was absolutely floored because I was like, if the first game was that easy, the second game, what? It's this easy? <laughs> and I do think... Arguably easier, frankly. Um, I, I know you probably think game one is easier. I, I don't know. And we'll talk about why, for me, Game 2 was pretty pretty straightforward, even relative to Game 1. I'll tell you what I think the problem is with Game 2. It's that it put people on the point of understanding how that rotating block was going to interact in only five spaces. Mm, and, yes. of course, one of the ways to attack this game, and I think it's a great one, is to show the templates. Mm-hmm. That block can only go in three positions, and because there's only five spaces, you're taking up 40% of the real estate right there. Why not show it? You don't have to do each one F, then S, and then reverse it SF. Just show it. Show a circle. Yeah. SF taking up two spaces in some order, and then see what happens thereafter. It's really, really limited. There's not a whole lot going on. Yeah. There's only three templates, and one of those templates is perfectly filled in aside from the rotation of the block which is just always spinning yeah but yeah man it was as soon as i saw that i just bang 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 sketched them out and that was that yeah i think th- there's one of the questions i think question nine is the one that probably got some people because they didn't really look carefully at what was happening with the placement of p and g and how it affected that block yeah i almost undercounted because i forgot for a hot second that the block can ro- can rotate can move yeah. Which, if you have it as an actual block, if you don't catch that, you're going to be one short here for number nine. Yeah, I did not. I showed it as, as the circle. The I have it as the circle, block. too, and just, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the amazing thing there is, is aside from that question, the, this game has very little going on. And when you have five spaces, just keep this in mind. You don't see this all that often in games anymore. When you have five spaces, if you have a rule involving a block, that block is immediately uh, an option for templating the game. Yep. Because in five spaces, that block can only go just on its own in worst four case. positions. In worst case, it can do four things. Yeah. And in this case, because of the sequence, there's only three placements for it. Yeah. And so, as I looked at this, and again, it's only five questions as well. So, they've given you two cake-level games to start this with, of course, only ten questions. You'd have to come out of the first two games thinking two things. I better have dominated that. I better be well ahead of time because you should not be spending eight minutes and 45 seconds on two games like this that have only five questions each. You should probably be spending like at most six minutes. Six was my, yeah. Yeah, to get through this. So that's the first thing. You should be in a dominant position, feeling good. You should also be thinking to (laughs) yourself, what's next? Oh, no. (laughs) What kind of evil lurks in games three and four that I need to be wary of? Because I don't. I can't recall a game section starting off with two games like this, where it's like, really? I don't know. How, I think I was able to probably do both games in about three minutes each. It was just like bang. Yeah, I, I think I was at probably the six minute mark when I was moving to game three. Yeah, and I and part of it was I stopped to check myself. I was like, did I misunderstand <laughs> Since, this? Have I blown it on the easiest thing? Yeah, and again, we do games for a living and and love them, obviously. I even wrote a book about it. I like them so much. So we should be able to do that. But if you at the can't same do time, game two when you've actually written drills that match it, like <laughs> I'm pretty hang, sure I've written that exact hang drill. Hang it up. Dude. Yeah, I can't say for sure it was that exact <laughs> drill, and it didn't have all the questions. But I was like, ah, oh, this is right out of the book, of course. So anyway, but yeah, I mean, too good to be true is a very genuine LSAT phenomenon. When you're starting to feel like, could it really be this good? It can be, but it probably won't last. And that's kind of what happened. Although it, the, the hammer didn't come down. No, nah, it didn't fall as hard as it as, as sometimes it has. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be thinking, uh, oh, virus game. Right. Kind of level stuff. So we go into the third game. And I, I, I love this game. I am a, I'm a big fan of this game. Um, it's the kind of game, out of all of these four games, this is the one that I would say to students, go study this guy. 
because it is really interesting and it's got features that are completely normal and that are very likely to come up again and again. That's a little different than the fourth game, which I also like as well, by the way. Me too. But I feel like this one is more standardized, whereas there's a little twisty in the fourth game that uh, you, you kind of have to understand how everything works out. But we'll yeah, get to that. By standardized, I take you to mean this is a little more representative of what people are most likely to see going forward relative to game four. As yeah. a predictive element, I think game three is probably your better bet. Exactly. I can I can look at game three and think to myself, well, I've seen this before, before, right, before, right, before, right, all right. these different places. And I, and I look at all elements of this game and feel that way. It feels like it was drawn from the bookshelf of standard game elements. That doesn't mean that it was easy. Yeah. I'm just saying that the elements that are inside this. And so when we get here, you can see there's seven questions now. So they've they're going to they're going to force you to spend more time. You had it easy in the first two. Now that time that you hopefully built up, you've got to expend some of it. And that's going to be the case with both game 3 and game 4. They're yeah. going to they're going to require more time. Well, what was it about game 3 in particular? Get a little more specific that you liked so much because I definitely have my moments here too. Well, I like some of the questions. So we'll talk about those in a minute. Okay. There's a few questions in here that I think are really important to review and understand. But I, I just kind of like the rules. I liked how it set itself up where you had like the, the row for the oils, the, the row for the watercolors, and it's a 2 one, one distribution. Yeah, two rows of four with three things that can go into each row. Yeah, and I like that because it gives me that 2 one, one distribution. I, I can control that. I feel like there's a segment of students out there who are like who maybe have never looked at games before or really didn't prepare properly. They're already in trouble, and so I'm like, we're moving through that lower level and getting into kind of like higher level analyses, and I feel comfortable there. And if you're listening to this podcast, you're you're already at a point where you, you should be comfortable with that. It shows that you've gone beyond just like the the surface preparation that some people do. I love the last rule. You know, this yeah, is that was says, easily the standout rule for me because it's the weirdest yeah. one, or at least it's the cleverest one. Oh, it's great. H cannot be shown earlier than the third week unless I is shown in the first week. So the first thing that jumps out to me is you better understand how to diagram a conditional rule in a conditional relationship. You can't yeah, be with stopping, unless in it especially. Yeah, you can't fumble around on this. This should be an instantaneous diagram. And the necessary condition there is I in the first week. But notice what they did. And this is what I really appreciated. The, the condition in the, that's going to be sufficient is that H is shown earlier than the third week. That's the negation. So H is shown earlier than the third week. Well, your natural inclination is to think, well, that means if H is first or second, then I is first. So that's not really possible now, yeah, is think it? Think about what that does to H, right? H first or second. H has got to be second. H isn't going to be first. So if H is second, I is first. And then, of course, the yeah. contrapositive. That's what that rule translates into, which is just so great. If H is two, I is one. And what the contrapositive does is pretty great, too. Because it means, interestingly enough, if I is not one, and we just established H can never be, that makes the third thing have to be first for the contrapositive. The third thing being, I think, G, if I remember this right. Yeah, that's your uh, your remaining guy who yeah. all of a sudden pops Which, in. If G is one, then we know H is in three <laughs> or four. So it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And to me, the other part of that rule that I thought was so great, and, and maybe even the broader illustration of a, a deeper point or a more salient point across the landscape, is any time you see a variable set that's that small, three selection choices for these spaces in each row, focus on it. It's yep. going to dominate the game. I mean, and that, it's funny, that was actually the thing that stood out to me through these first three games. I was like, we went from six to five, now we're down to just three choices. The reason a small variable set like that is so powerful, I'm not talking to you, of course, Dave, you know, is that it doesn't take much to force things to happen. If you can eliminate one of the three, you've actually got something of an inference there. You can make determinations very quickly. And there was yeah. a lot of that in this game, especially into the questions. It's kind of like a rule of three or the power of three. Whenever you have like a triple like this, that is so limiting. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just run through that rule the way you stated it, just so it's clear to everybody. Yeah, I probably went through it quickly. <laughs> so the rule as it's stated and, and then kind of like as we figured it out is if H is second, then I is first. So the contrapositive is if I is not first, then H has got to be third or fourth. Right. 
All right. Now, that means that when we look at the very first space, it's not H because it's third or fourth. H is it's never not. first. That was a not law there we just figured out. Exactly. And so, I is also not first. So, if I isn't first, what's your option there? It's going to be G. And so, that's what John was saying was yeah. kind of like the sequence there of, of inference making. And it happened because there were only three variables. That's and right. Once if we'd had four, five, six variables, we couldn't have made it such an absolute. Yeah, once we knocked out I and H, G was like, I'm the only one here. I'm going first. Woo! So. Yeah. A party of three gets lonely in a hurry, basically. It doesn't take much. <laughs> uh, it really does. So, I, I love that. And I, when I looked at these rules, the way they had it set up, there's certainly, you know, the kind of thing, like that third rule, H must be shown in any week in which sales is shown and, and the conditionality that's there with, with, with a block and just kind of working with things. You can see that there's a lot of interaction. Yeah, and let's to, touch on that rule again because you said conditionality and then block. And I want to make sure people actually distinguish those two things. H and S don't have to go together. Based right. on rule. H is shown any week in which sales is shown. Sales is the trigger there. Yep. Sales brings H with it every time, but H can still float. And that's key because the way they've worded that third rule is tricky. Yep. You can't just look at it and be like, oh, that's an HS block. You have to realize that they're saying in any week in which sales is shown. So as you said, sales is the trigger. When you yep. have S, then you've got to have H as well. Yep. So every time there's S, it's an S and H block. Right. So to me, that's S arrow, SH block. A lot of people would just show that as a block, and it's very misleading if you do that. Yes, and that is exactly the case. That's how I had that rule diagram because they've done this. That photographs game uh, from years ago where they have got uh, the various people in the photographs have rules stated like this. And so this is a way they've gotten around the Who's fact that... that the one about the friends in the photograph, the Raymundo yep. and Ty and... Yeah. Yep, that's exactly the game we're talking Pure about. Pure grouping. And so, in this particular case, they have started to, you know, word rules like this that get away from just standard if-thens. And the clear point of them doing that is because most people now understand if-then diagramming. They've been taught it repeatedly. Yeah. 20 years ago, they didn't. There was very few options on a national level where people were being taught the, the proper ways to do yeah. games. Yeah. That has changed, fortunately. Yeah. The last rule I want to point out is the first one and how impactful this is because it's a global rule. No painting, any of them, can be shown in two consecutive weeks. What that means with only three things to choose is as soon as you put anything anywhere, you've immediately eliminated one of your three from the next week or the weeks the adjacent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you put G into three, you know right away that it's H and I into two and four uh, in think, some order in some configuration. Yeah, a very standard rule overall. Yeah. But when you add it into the other rules, it starts to become very powerful collectively. Oh, yeah. Powerful because there's so few variables. So I just pound this into the heads of people I talk to about this. I mean, figuratively. Of when you see a small group, two, three, four things, that becomes laser beam focused because that's going to control everything. Yeah. And to me, there's two questions in here I think are really useful to look at, 14 and 16. Yeah. And the the kind of like beautiful inference chain that you get, the, 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 they fall like dominoes. You know, you put in question 14 G in the first week, you need to then be able to say, well, what does that mean for this? What does that mean for that? And literally follow the pathway all the way around. Mm -hmm. And there's more than like one or two steps. It's a classic LSAT inference chain of like five, six steps. Yeah. And they do that again in question 16, where it's another set of long inferences where you start really just jumping all over the place. Go look at those questions if you're studying this test. See how you did on them if you did take this test live or if you took it as a practice test, because they require some insight into the way rules work together. They require some time, but they're eminently solvable. The question is, is, is it going to take you 30 seconds 60 seconds or, you know, two to three minutes. You don't want to be in a position where it's taking two to three minutes. You, yeah. you want to be able to hit the dominoes one after another. But I love those two questions. As soon as I did them, I put a little star by them. I was like, I like these. I would love to teach these in class. Yeah. It's funny. I jumped around a little here. I did the first question because it was just a simple list. I wanted to make sure I hadn't screwed anything up. Yeah. Went to 12, went to 14, went to 16. And at that point, I was like, all right, this is cake. You're just jumping around doing local questions? Yeah. Just for the fun of it. Well, just because I feel like, look, if local questions, if you can get it down to one on those, you've mostly demonstrated. And there's a trigger, so if you feel any uncertainty, it at least gives you some firm jumping off point. For I me, those were questions where I was like, let me just make sure I've got all this straight. 
answer choice, answer choice, answer choice, I'm good. And at that point, I would have turned back and probably done, you know, 13, 15, and then the only rule substitution question uh, in the section, which was 17. And and you've done a bunch of hypotheticals with all those local questions, too. Yeah, at that point, you've got so much work shown already. Yeah, if, if you're ever in trouble in a logic game and you're like, I don't know if I understand this, do review the global questions because there might be a huge inference that you're missing, but also go to the local questions and if you, for example, if you see a global question, you glance at them and you're like, okay, there's nothing here that seems like a huge inference, then go to the local questions. Just do those because it'll give you a hypothetical each time. If if not fully, then partially. Yeah. And that gives you insight and tells you, as John said, all right, I'm doing this right. I'm, I understand it. I'm comfortable. Yeah. And then you end on this, this particular uh, game rule substitution question, kind of a standard on, yeah. on pretty much every LSAT these days. This one wasn't too bad. No, I thought this was a very reasonable one overall. But I liked that game. That was actually a fun game. There's some good inferences up front that you can draw if you know what you're doing. That's not always the case. Those are kind of dull moments when it's not, it's just empty going in. But this game and game four both had a couple of inferences that I thought were kind of Talk, neat, talk neat. to me about game four. I think you probably liked it more than I did. Uh, you know, I, I, know. I liked it because I, I caught a couple of the inferences and was just feeling you felt good about it. Oh, yeah. Like, you right. did well, so you liked it. Yay, me. <laughs> um, let me uh, describe a little bit of what's going on in game four before I start talking about things like linear and, and the days and stuff. Um, because there's a few early points here where you could screw things up or at least get yourself confused. There were five people going into what turned out to be nine spots. Three days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, each with three people. So clearly we were going to have to reuse some of these folks. Yeah, everybody had to be used. Going to use all five, fill these nine spaces, three, 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 three days. How are we going to do it? And as soon as I saw that, I was like, how are we going to do it? And so I just started thinking about the distribution. There's only one. There's only one way to do this with these five people. Two, 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 one. You got four people going twice, and then this solo guy who only shows up once. Yeah, so I was let like, me... Yeah. Let me just interrupt quickly to, to run that through. So you got five people. Okay. Each of them has to work once. So right. your minimum number of work spaces filled is five. You're trying to fill nine, but you have five filled at the minimum. So that leaves you with extra four to distribute. But nobody can work all three days. Yeah, so yeah that's an important point. Good. Yeah, yeah thanks. The maximum that anybody can work is two days. That means every single part of the solution here has to be one or two. Well, when you have four extra days, you can't put two on, on one, get to three. You have to parcel them out one to each of the first four people or four people. And that's where you get that two, 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 one distribution. Yeah. So I one forgot person will be three, solo. Right. If somebody could have gone all three days or multiple people could have gone, there'd have been several distributions possible here. Yeah. Totally changed this game. It totally would have. In fact, you could have had like a five, one, one, whatever. Um, but with two as your max, there's you one couldn't distribution. Have had five. Hmm? You couldn't have had five. It would have been three max. Because that maximum they could have worked is three. Well, if you could go twice in a day or something, I'm saying. Five into nine with no restrictions. You could have a five, one, 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 one. Yes, with no restrictions. Right. In a world where cloning exists, okay. John is correct. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that all three day thing restricted it and that became your distribution. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, man, this is going to really dominate and control things. Let's just see if we can figure out who the doubles are. Or, and once again, focusing on small groups, there's only three people each day. There's only five people to pick from. It's not going to take the removal of very many people before I know the three that are left. Mm -hmm. And that especially is key on Saturday, where we had a not law eliminating one of the people. So Saturday straight away became my focal point. Yeah, Pang got knocked out on Saturday. Was it? Who was it? Pang. Pang. Good old Pang. Nunez was on Friday. Pang was eliminated Sorry, from Pang. Saturday. So it turns out you've only got four options into those three. And two of those four options were related conditionally, which means you couldn't lose the necessary condition, take out too much. Uh -huh. Inference, the necessary guy had to be there. I won't yeah. tell you who that was. I'll leave some mystery oh, to this. Come on. Well, he's spoiling everybody's fun. <laughs> You're that guy who sees like Avengers on opening night already. and wants to tell, text everybody. <laughs> uh, all right, I'll accept it. You don't have to spoil it. <laughs> but... Again, it's another, I mean, to me, the real spoiler in this is just if you're focused on small groups, you're going to see these kinds of things. Three spaces to fill on each day. You only had five candidates. Some of these guys had relationships. Doesn't take much. That's exactly right. 
I thought it, it's if you didn't approach it from that angle, and obviously I went right at the distribution. I mentioned it in the webinar last night. It was like the first thing that jumped out to me. And it had, I thought, a huge impact on this game in terms of understanding what was what could occur. If you didn't see it from that angle, I think this game is actually rather hard. Mm -hmm. And I could see where people who were walked out of this test were like, that was difficult. A lot of people were like, that volunteer booth game was tough. And I can, I, I agree. I think this is, to me, the hardest of the four games. I think so, too. So. You, know, it's, you know, it's funny, the comment that I heard oh, just over and over and over from people, you know, this, like misery commiseration that you get on places like our forum was oh god i figured out the inference as i was walking to my car <laughs> i hate that <laughs> <laughs> which is honestly it's worse than never figuring it out i think i hate hearing it for people i feel you know sympathetic i'm like oh that sucks to know after the fact yeah. <laughs> it's like walking out of a job interview and thinking this is what i should have said oh, yeah 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 <laughs> anyway Overall, but, yeah, though, just pretty good. despite the fact that the third and fourth games were harder, they had to be harder to cover up the first and second. And this fourth game isn't so, you know, killer level or destroyer level that it offsets the ease of the first two games. And so this section overall, pretty reasonable. Even if you're not fantastic at games, you're going to do well on the first two and you're going to be able to pull some right answers out of games three and four and, and at least post a reasonably good score. So the problem is, is that the scaling on this test doesn't allow you to have like really that many misses. And so you get punished when you're not able to get through it all. And that's where they came back and they said, hey, we think this test is on the easier side. So now you better get a lot more right. And that was the, the trade off that you got from the, the so-called easier level questions yeah. that are throughout each of the sections here. Yeah, nothing punishing, but no room for carelessness, really. Yeah, and I don't love that for the, the vast majority of students because that puts a lot of pressure and makes makes it so you can't ever really get fatigued. You can't have a momentary blip. You've got to be running on all cylinders throughout the entire exam. That's tough. Yeah, I know a lot of high scorers who, I mean, at the very last minute with that last game, didn't catch the inference or didn't catch the distribution, couldn't put it together. And on a test where you can only miss 10 for the 170s, that's it. That's it's all really tough. Yeah. Very much of a challenge. So I think, you know, we've given a pretty good overall view of, of how we feel about the difficulty. I feel like I just game. took it. <laughs> <laughs> I love talking about it, you know, because you don't necessarily get like a, a game by game overview of these exams when you're able to really talk about it at length. We're able to do it now with release tests, but so often these tests are unreleased that we don't get a chance to really see it and and be like, well, what happened? What should have happened? How, yeah, how should have been people since have done? last November? We could even look at any new LSAT content. That's right. I wish they'd release more tests each year, but we know that's not going to happen. At least spread them out a little more evenly. June, yeah. September, November, and then you go on this, what, like eight month hiatus? <laughs> Come on. Uh, that's the world we live in, John. But yeah, I mean, no, this is fun. I actually love looking at it. I would take more LSATs if they were bourbon. Very good. If I, you know, and given where we're at now, I finished my Pimm's cup and there's no refill here. So oh, I've, got, I've got a bottle right here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yours requires I, a lot more making than mine does. That's true. It really does. <laughs> anyway, I think that wraps it up. You got any final comments on it? Uh, no, just score release. When will people who took the test uh, was what last Thursday, six twenty seven? Yeah, they already okay. have their score. <laughs> I guess they do. I meant public release. Do you know when this thing's actually coming out for sale? There's I didn't actually mean score a, release, I meant test release. Apparently, July 5th is the date that I'm seeing on Amazon. That I don't know whether be right. they'll be able to deliver that, but that's what it says. Usually, you'd expect it in early August. That's right. Yeah, it usually takes like at least a month. Yeah, I think you mean not uh, I score didn't mean release, score release. I meant test, test release. Like, when is the test available? For anyone who's listening <laughs> to this and wants to know what the hell we're talking about. We have the test because they released the score. That's right. I believe that I saw a link on Amazon to this exam, and... Amazon changes things and can be unreliable with this, but they said July 5th, which would be great if you were able to like get it quickly. Um, if not, I would expect it no later than, say, early August, but let's hope it's July 5th. I'm looking at it right here, man. It does say July 5th. Available for pre-order. Available? For, well, let's see what happens. I'll keep an eye on it. <laughs> yeah. Either way. Um, so, anybody who wants to get in there and pre-order this, it could be an interesting weekend at this rate. 
It could be. Yeah. Fun LSAT taking weekend, and hopefully you listen to this after you've taken this test instead of. Or you realize before. early on that you should <laughs> we're going to disclose yeah. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I don't have anything else, man. A good test. I'm uh, I'm pleased with what I heard from people. I think most people came out of this feeling like it was reasonable. I saw some really high scores, so that too. made me happy. Yeah. And I've ran into a lot of people who felt like they did where they felt they could do. They hit their potential. So that's always nice. If you're listening, anyway, that, you took it. We hope that's you. Yes, indeed, we do. But that wraps it up. I don't have any further comments either because I think I've said more than enough. So <laughs> I will go ahead and say thanks so much, everybody, for listening. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube, or any other place in the world that you find this. Give us a rating as well. And if you have questions, we're going to be doing a mailbag relatively soon here. We'll get back on track with some uh, regularity of these episodes now that uh, the July test is basically upon us. You can send questions to LSAT at PowerScore.com or LSAT Podcast at PowerScore.com. Have a great week and a happy 4th of July to everybody. Everybody.